So hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the AI Hardware Show 2023. In this episode, a little bit of back and forth between training and inference. But as always, joining me is the our intrepid co-host, Sally Ward-Foxton from EE Times. Uh, but as you might say, we're trained <laughs> to make you happy. <laughs> This episode of the Air Hardware Show is sponsored by Tens Torrent. That's Tens Torrent, the Jim Keller company. Find out more later in the episode. Accelera is an edge AI chip company that's been spun out of Bitfury, the blockchain technology company. Bitfury has multiple generations of ASIC silicon for Bitcoin mining under its belt. And this company, Accelera, has spun out of that division. Bitfury has been incubating Accelera since 2019 until last year. Accelera is based in Europe with people in the Netherlands, Belgium, Switzerland, and they've licensed some IP from European research institute, IMEC. They're still preparing to launch the first product, but they have a test chip up and running uh, with some pretty impressive performance and efficiency figures. The company's Theta score is a digital in-memory compute design, meaning it mixes bits of compute in with memory to avoid moving data on and off the chip. The test chip, fabricated on a 12 nanometer process node, can achieve 39.3 int 8 tops with a power efficiency of 14.1 tops per watt, all from a silicon area of just 9 square millimeters. The operating frequency can also be tweaked to improve energy efficiency, and it can be combined with some work on sparse activations so they can get up to 33 tops per watt. We don't know much about the design of the core or the final product just yet, except we've been told the final design will be multi-core and it'll be hundreds of tops. But we do know the company has some expertise in Risk V design, so that could be a clue. Accelera should be launching its first commercial product any day now, and we expect that since they've said it'll be hundreds of tops, they'll be targeting robotics, drones, and video analytics at the edge. Moving from one European startup to another, Graphcore was one of the earliest entrants in the AI hardware space, and is currently one of the most funded, with three generations of products down the line. That first generation... I always remember it as being one of the most colorful products available on the market. The latest product is the Bow IPU, and it builds on previous generations by using the same architecture, but adds in TSMC's wafer-on-wafer wafer technology to build the power delivery underneath and offer 40% better frequency at less power than before. A standard 4 IPU system can be built into a 64-unit pod or 128 units, with Graphcore customers relying on its popular software for scaling. Despite Graphcore not having any major volume customers to date, a little bit more on that in a second, it has put plans in place for its next generation product to be commercially available in a good computer. That's good computer, named after Jack Good. And for $120 million, will supposedly offer 10 exaflops of FP16 compute. 10 exaflops. It, has, it will have four petabytes of memory and support for 500 trillion parameter models, which is much more than, say, the 10 trillion that Cerebrus talks about today. With the new packaging technology, that could scale even more. For reference here, NVIDIA expects to meet 10 exa ops of FP16 with as few as 100 H100 GPUs available later in the cycle. The one thing about Graphcore right now, however, is that they have currently in initiated some layoffs of its staff. Despite being one of the best funded AI chips out there in the market, because it's one of the first, and we've been in this period of such a long AI cycle where everything is fast paced, you have to wonder if some of those early companies, like Mythic, are feeling the effects of such a wide ecosystem over such a long time growing rapidly. It's been reported that Graphcore has a 200 million burn with a 5 million revenue last year. Nothing I can confirm myself, but with those sorts of numbers, you do have to wonder where Graphcore goes on from here. So from a company that's building a computer named after somebody with a brain, here's a chip that supposedly has a brain. So from a company called Grey Matter, you'd expect more than a little bit of inspiration from the brain. The company's Neuron Flow Core uses concepts from event-based sensing and sparsity to process audio and vis vision data efficiently. This means using a stateful neuron design, one that remembers the past, to process only information that's changed between one frame of a video and the next, 
which helps avoid processing unchanged parts of the frames over and over again. Combine this with aspects of near memory compute and data flow architectures, and the result is low latency, low power, real-time computer vision. Graymatter's third gen chip, Gravy, Gravy IP, can do around 20x the inferences per watt compared to a comparable GPU. Its power envelope is tens to hundreds of milliwatts. While most AI at the edge is concerned with extracting metadata, low bandwidth information we can use to make decisions, like, is there a cat in this video, yes or no? Grey Matters chip is designed to perform audio and video manipulation where the output is just as high bandwidth as the input. Overall, this means different requirements for latency and quality. New to the third gen is FP16 capability for inference, which is quite unusual for an edge chip, but you need it for real-time audio processing, which is a key use case here. Grey Matter balances the power required for this with the energy they save from their sparsity concept. Higher precision also means you can do more pruning, so models can be smaller overall, so overall it balances out. Grey Matter has a cool demo with audio where AI separates the vocals from the music, and you can use this in a karaoke machine to remove the vocals and sing along yourself. Up next, I'm going to talk about Tens Torrent and its latest generation chip, Wormhole. So many thanks to Tens Torrent for sponsoring this episode. Tens Torrent has multiple generations of hardware. Two are in production, and there's at least two on the roadmap that we know about. They're exploring what the ideal size is for matrix multiply engines. They've got their own RISC-V cores coming out. They're expanding into chiplets, high performance. I've interviewed Jim Keller a couple of times on this channel. You should definitely check those videos out, explaining how Tense Torrent isn't just an AI hardware company. They're a design company. You can expect AI hardware, chiplets, all sorts of stuff to come out of them over the next few years. Keep track on this channel to find out more and click the links in the video description also if you're interested in a job because they're hiring. Now, Tens Torrent is more than just one person at a company. We've all heard of Jim Keller. I mean, we have, haven't you? Jim Keller typically has been at companies where whatever chip he makes turns to magic. Well, now he's at Tens Torrent, he's a CTO, and he's currently working on AI chips with 10.6 cores and RISC-V cores. Wormhole chip is the latest generation. The whole point of this chip is that the core looks like the chip, looks like the system. So you can scale out to as many chips as you need in a 2D network for your machine learning solution. Problem here, as when I asked Jim how much the cables cost in such a design, literally the cables connecting chip to chip, over a few racks he said the cost is about half. Well, you know, there's some growing pains for a lot of AI chip companies out there. But this chip is geared towards transformer models. Transformer models are the hot source in the market today. But with transformer models, when you calculate machine learning layers, sometimes you need to do a little bit of compute in between. On a GPU, this would be this would mean farming off the data to the CPU to do the calculation, then putting it back on the GPU. What Tense Torrent is doing here with its RISC-V cores is it's providing that compute on chip. So you save the time and you save the power. Now, this idea of scale out here is something that uh, Tens Torrent has been talking about for a while. Jim has said that ideally they want to be able to build a system of a thousand chips to get customers who want 10,000. Build 10,000 chip system to get customers who want 100,000. 100,000 chips, customers who want a million. And then they can go after the major cloud players. Being able to represent your system from a core, looks like a chip, looks like a full system, is going to be good when it comes to actually developing the software. Tense Torrent has been very vocal that their software team, their compiler team, is bigger than their hardware team. And ultimately, the compiler kind of came first. I'm very hopeful that Tense Torrent is going to produce something worth looking into, you know, especially with Jim at the helm. You can't really let that one go. Sorry. One of the longest established AI chip startups is Sintient. Sintient's well known for making ultra low power AI accelerators for keyword spotting in consumer electronics. So low power that the chip can be always on, always listening, even for battery powered devices. Sintient's latest devices are based on the second gen core. The new core uses the same near memory compute architecture, but is bigger for models up to 7 million parameters. That means the space to run inference for more than one model at the same time. For audio, that might be echo cancellation, beam forming, speaker identification, alongside voice command recognition, all for under a milliwatt. 
The core has a new high precision mode, 16 bit, but it supports down to one bit. The chip also has a Tensilica Hi-Fi 3 DSP that can be used for future extraction, and there's an ARM Cortex M0 to manage it all. All in all, there's 6.4 gigaops of acceleration. Keyword spotting inference can take as little as 280 microwatts. While the Sintiant core can run many different kinds of networks, the I.O. on the NDP120 is geared up for audio. It can support seven audio streams. It can also be used for inference on sensor data like vibration, temperature sensing. Another device, the NDP200, can run image processing and computer vision tasks such as visual wake words based on the same core. So finally for this episode, I'm going to take it to the max. And by that, I mean Intel's max GPU. As we're filming this, they literally announced the naming for this part last week, and it's what we typically know as Ponte Vecchio. Now, Ponte Vecchio has been a pretty impressive chip if you've been following its development lifecycle. It's one of these chips with so many tiles, you're not quite sure how exactly they put it together. Something like Emib Foros for its 47 tiles. They're quoting 52 teraflops of compute, and we're going to see it in both PCIe and uh, Open Compute Project uh, Accelerator Module form factors for the larger installations such as supercomputers. Now this chip is built to do it all. On board, it's up to 128 gigabytes of HBM2E memory. PCIe card only has 48, but that still seems plenty enough. And at the top model, 600 watts. These chips initially are going to go into Argon's uh, Aurora supercomputer. That's really what they were built for, and they're going to get all the chips they can get until that machine is uh, filled out. And then the rest of us will get to play with them. Well, perhaps, kind of. The cores based here are similar to the ones used in its discrete GPUs, but we're more focused on sort of matrix math and that sort of HPC AI types of workload. Uh, if you've ever seen Raja holding one of these chips, yeah, I mean, it's a pretty impressive chip. Uh, but we just need to see it up and running. Uh, max, max GPU as a name sounds pretty good, taking it to the max. And they've already announced uh, at least the generation afterwards called Rialto Bridge. And then after that, it's Falcon Shores. We may speak about those in another episode. In terms of AI workloads here, though, yes, it can do it. But Aurora is going to be doing HPC first. We're going to see AI further down the line. It supports a lot of those reduced precision modes as a lot of Intel's GPU stuff does. But I think we're going to have to wait on this one. If you've enjoyed this episode, well, then next week we're going to have another. But if you can't wait, then check the link below and head on over to the After Show podcast, where Sally and I are going to speak about these chips in a little bit more relaxed format. And we've got some things to say. We have much to say on all of them. <laughs> Every single one. In so, detail, yeah. <laughs> Good so luck. Tune in and uh, we'll see you next time.